Good morning. Today is 30 November, the year 2009. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum along with uh, fellow volunteers, uh, Dr. Jack Herlin and uh, Julie Curtis, and special guests, Helen Sanders. <laughs> and today, we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Sergeant Davette Sanders. Sergeant Sanders was a B-17 ground crewman refueling aircraft in England during World War II. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Nice to have you here, Dave. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great. Okay. Now, first of all, I'm going to get you lined up here. Okay. Okay, Dave, first of all, would, would you spell and pronounce your full name, please? Would you spell? Oh, yes. Spell it first. Mm -hmm. D A V E T T E S A N D E R S Sanders. And when and where were you born? In the Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma, near McAllister, Oklahoma. And uh, what year and date was that? Uh, September the sixth, nineteen and twenty-one. Nineteen. So how many years did that? How many years young does that make you? How many years old are you now? I was 88 years old, 6th of last September. Well, Doctor, he looks pretty good for 88. Very what good. do you think? Very good. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and your father, what was his name? Albert Emanuel. And what did he do? He was a farmer, a rancher. Okay. Uh, how many acres did he have? Uh, that I'm not sure I can't tell much because uh, it was uh, I was had 13 of us in the family 13 oh. children oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, 11 boys and two girls and and, uh, and I was uh, long towards the uh, ninth or tenth something <laughs> like that so I uh, I don't know a lot about Did it. you grow up on the farm? Yes, I did. Okay. And what did uh, you have cattle? What, what did you have? Uh, we had wheat? cattle, we had uh, uh, grain and uh, tomatoes. We did, Back where we were at that time, we farmed tomatoes, grow tomatoes mm -hmm. for canning and canning factories and so forth. Now, um, was it near any Indian reservations where, where you grew up? This was in... Um, Arkansas. Uh, the, the, we left Henrietta, Oklahoma when I was five years old and moved to northwest Arkansas, okay. near Fedville, Arkansas. All right. And we uh, farmed in that area till I grew up to be 17 when I left home and went to California. Okay. And uh, your father, uh, how did he end up in Oklahoma? Where did his ancestors all come from? He was born in, I believe they called it Sweetwater, Mississippi, and he and mother were, uh, I guess uh, they were married in Coal Hill, Arkansas, but I don't know a whole lot about their, okay. I, I never did know any of my grandparents, they were, they were all gone before. And I, you don't know where in the old country they might have come from? Not really. Okay. And your mother, what was her name and her maiden name? Edna Viola Day was her maiden name. D-A-Y? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, so she and your dad met in Mississippi, did you say? Where, where did they meet, your mom My and dad? My father was born in Mississippi. My mother was born in Coal Hill, Arkansas, I believe. Oh, okay. And I think that's where they met, they met in Arkansas. to the best of my knowledge. Okay. Um, your brothers and sisters, do we dare try to name them all? Yes, I should I name the ones that have passed on yep, as children. Yep, yep. Claude was the oldest. He was born in 1909. 
I should I should have told when my mother and father was married in 1907. Mm -hmm. My father was born in 1885. My mother was born in 1891. And then my they were married September of 1907. And my first brother was Claude and he died as in childhood. Oh. And then Albert Lee was the second one. He was born in 1911 and he uh, should I go na name the? Well, I, would, I would just name. Okay, why don't you just name them all first? And okay. I, I, and doesn't you don't need to say when they were born. Just just the names of what I'm. Okay. okay. Uh, Claude and Albert Lee, Joseph S. Uh, Kenneth E. And uh, Elvin Emmanuel. Uh, Melvin Ellick and uh, Leonard and then myself, David and then Ralph and then Francis and Janie and Bob and Chester. I can tell you all their birth dates but I <laughs> but wouldn't <laughs> try and do it now. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that, that's pretty impressive. Um, and how many or which ones are still alive and where do they uh, and where do they live there's only six of us still alive now uh, Melvin uh, Francis and Janie and chest Bob and Chester and myself are still living and Chester is the youngest he's 77 years old do most of them live here in California? Do most of them live in California here? No, most of them live in the, uh, Northwest Arkansas. Okay. Um, and David, now, uh, how did you get that name? That I was born in the Choctaw Nation, and uh, my father was half Cherokee Indian, I understand, and his mother was an Indian herb doctor. And so they allowed an uh, Indian squaw in that area to give me the name Davette. And no middle initial, just <laughs> Davette. So I, I never did like it too well, so I just always go by the name Dave or David. Right. Um, and was your family very religious? Did you all go to church a lot? My mother at an early age was Mormon, but she, uh, when my four older brothers was going to a church, a Baptist church in Northwest Arkansas, and they were all saved and baptized, four of them at the same day that they were baptized. So mother decided that she knew that she had been saved, but she joined the Baptist church and was baptized when there was snow on the ground in the river, she was baptized. <laughs> and they dunk them right in the river, right? <laughs> in a snow-covered river. <laughs> um, you, what did your kids do for fun when you were growing up? What did your kids do for fun, for recreation? What did your kids do for fun when you were growing Hunting up? Hunting and fishing and things of that sort. It, we lived in the country. It was uh, 20 miles to the closest little town actually and the, so we had a rough time of it during the depression years it was a very very rough time we went hungry a little bit a few times because of the drought conditions as you probably remember the sandstorm that blew all the Kansas and Missouri and Oklahoma blew all the uh, cultivating soil blew it away they I forget what they call the, uh, but it was uh, there was a name for well, it. Do you remember any of those dust storms that they had? Do you ever oh, you remember going you. through? I, was, I remember the, the, whenever the banks all closed in 1929, the banks all closed just overnight like that. And uh, many of the people, especially we heard about them in New York, that 
jumped out of windows, committed suicide because of the bank closing down and nobody had any money to do anything with. I mean, even the farmers that had money that they could have paid off their farms, they lost their farms right. because of But do you remember seeing any of those dust storms that they talk about, how the wind well, blew all the dust we and everything? In that area the, that much. We were in northwest Arkansas and these dust storms were mostly in Kansas and Oklahoma and Missouri and that in that area when they when it they said it actually where the land was cultivated it blew it down to a hard bottom that just blew all the topsoil away from the farms. And what kind of gun did you use when you went hunting? Mostly a 22, but a 410 shotgun and a 12 gauge shotgun. And what uh, what kind of game would you be hunting? Uh, ducks, geese, squirrels, rabbits. And you ate? I'm sure you ate what you killed. I'm sure you ate what you shot, what you killed. Did you eat? Put it on your mother. Fix it on the uh, for supper, or did you eat uh, what you? Oh would, yeah, mother would. Uh, mother, we would skin them out, and mother would cook them, and we would eat them. Yeah, we did too. <laughs> They're pretty good. I, uh, rabbit and squirrel. I I hunted when I was a kid. And I never did like squirrel myself. It was when <laughs> <laughs> I like. We ate rabbits in the winter time, but you didn't do them in the summer because they got some kind of a problem with them in the yeah. summer, so you ate them in the winter time. Yeah. I think actually but when I hunted, the hunting season was in the winter anyway. You, you couldn't hunt them in the summer anyhow where we lived. Um, we butchered our own hogs and so forth. We did our own butchering and mother and dad took care of the meat. My father would cut it out and shape it, the bacon part and the hams and shoulders pack them in salt and cure them and then put them in a smokehouse and smoke it yeah. and make make the meat. Did you uh, have milk cows? Yes, we did. We milk cows. That's Actually, we lived on milk and cornbread a lot for our evening meal as we lived on the farm. That's what we ate for our evening meal was milk and cornbread. <laughs> And the uh, church you went to, how close was that to your house? It was a, a landmark missionary Baptist church. Actually, we were meeting in the same building that I went to school, what little I went to school. I didn't get a lot of education, so. Yeah. <laughs> because we were busy working on the farm. Even as a seven-year-old, I was doing a lot of farm work. And when you went fishing, were there uh, creeks or rivers or lakes or rivers, mostly rivers. And what did you catch? Uh, I I don't know that I could name because there was uh, catfish and there was uh, suckers and uh, bass and bluegill and so forth. But frankly and honestly, I never was much of a fisherman. I liked to hunt, but yeah. my brothers and all of them, I was the black sheep of the family when it came to was fishing. It, was it much of a wooded, were there a lot of woods? Was it a, a wooded area? Where, did, when, like when you hunted squirrels, you had to be in some kind of woods or something? Oh yeah, something. there would, were wooded areas all around us. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, in actuality, we had to clear wooded areas for cultivating for farming a, a lot of the time. We did have apple orchards that we uh, raised apples also. Did you have a tractor or did you have to use the horses or we mules or whatever? We had to use whatever? a horse and a plow. Mm -hmm. And to give you an idea, when I was 13 years old, I worked for uh, 50 cents a day for plowing a team of horses with a big turning plow all day long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so did you go to high school then? I or? didn't. You, I never uh, got to go to high school. Okay. Um, do you remember what you were doing December 7th, 1941? Yes. I, I would tell my wife I was, we were at, went to La Harbor Missionary Baptist Church. That's where we were the day on the de December the 7th, 1941. So that's in California. Well, let's just back up just a little bit. How did you end up in California? Well, um, I had some brothers that had moved to California uh, from 32 to 36, three or four of them. And so 
when I was 17, I left the farm and came to California. And a lot of people did during the Depression. The They call them the Okies and everybody that came out to California. Right. It was a kind of part of that uh, trek Movement to the West. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Now, I, I came to California and then I, I met my wife and uh, I didn't go back to that place for <laughs> so five when you came, years. <laughs> when you came out, were you living with a bro one of your brothers? Or, I was or living with one of my brothers who was a missionary Baptist preacher. Oh. And so did you get a job? When you, did you get a job? Yes, I did. I, I picked fruit for a while and worked for the citrus business of fumigating and spraying and so forth and taking care of orange groves and lemons. And now, La Habra, tell me where La Habra is. La Habra is, uh, are, are you know where Disneyland is? It's just north of Disneyland, maybe six miles. And then Whittier is west of that, about five or six miles. Fullerton would be uh, south of La Habra. I'm sure it looked a lot different in those days than it does now. It had changed a lot. When, when I was, uh, at the time I went into the service, I was working for a Thermador Electric Company in Maywood at that time. Uh, we were building ammunition cans for the Navy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after I got out of the service, I went back there, but I went to work in the oil field shortly after and worked for five or six years. And then my brother and I went to work. Uh, he bought a 76 service station, and he and I operated that for about 36 or 37 years. Uh, where was that, your service? On Whittier Boulevard and Euclid Street in, in La Habra. Uh, uh, but when you first went to La Habra, there was probably a lot of citrus trees and it was probably more it was rural than it is just now. just a very right? small town and uh, even close to the main intersection there were orange groves and, and walnut groves and uh, lemons and avocados and so forth so yes it was strictly a little farming country I guess you would call. So did you have some girlfriends out here in California? Not too many. I, 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 I dated my wife. I started, uh, I met her. We had gone on a Christmas carol on the Christmas of 1939. Okay well, just hold that. I, I want to I wanna make sure that you are <laughs> talking, talking, uh, talking the, the truth here. <laughs> no. You do not speak with forked tongue, so, young lady. No. <clears throat> uh oh. Yeah, I, I'll have to walk it slowly. That's fine. Take my baby steps. <laughs> sure. Okay. There we go. Okay. Now. Oh. Look at that pretty girl. Okay, continue on, sir. <laughs> I'll, I'll just stay here for right now. So you, when did you meet her again? Where did you all meet? We met at the Baptist Church in uh, La Habra. And uh, at that time, I didn't have a car, but uh, about a year later in 1940, July of 1940, I bought a 1936 Chevy Coupe and then I was able to go and see her when I wanted to. <laughs> she lived in Fullerton. Okay. And uh, what was your maiden name? And uh, my maiden name was Fritz, Helen Francis Fritz. F-R-I-T-Z? F-R-I-T-T-S. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did your dad do? Well, my dad was semi-invalid. He wasn't too well, and he, he, um, uh, I don't, he, he was a carpenter. He did some carpenter work, and he also filed saws for people. Okay. Worked at home from. And uh, how did um, your family end up in California? Uh, my dad had a grocery store in Muskogee, and he had so much credit on the books from people not being able to pay their bills that. He began to go broke, and my aunt uh, lived in Fullerton, my mother's sister. And so they were encouraging us, or encouraging us to go to California. 
And how old were you when you came out here? Uh, seven. Okay. And where did you go to high school? Uh, Ford and Union High School. Uh -huh. Okay. And um, what did you do after high school? Went to Fullerton Junior College for a couple of years, and the college was very, uh, they were very helpful. If you showed some aptitude, whatever, if there was an opening of anything, di different companies would notify the college. Uh, and then, so my first job, they got it for me in a college, and I went to work in May before graduating in June. <laughs> so I had a little job there working for the ice company, and when it began to close down, um, I went to work for the Bank of America. Okay. And do you remember what you were doing December 7th, 1941? Oh, yes. I was with him. <laughs> oh, you were. <laughs> okay. Then, okay. Well, let's, let's uh, hear your version of how you guys first met. Well. You should mention that you came to California in a new Essex car. That Ooh. had a flat about every hundred miles. And <laughs> it took us a week to get to California. I, and there were six of us. Oh. I don't know how in the world, all I remember was pillows, and the kid, we were just packed in that car, and um, so, but, well, yeah, uh, I mean, I had been going to church uh, since I was 13 there at that church, and of course I got my eye on him, <laughs> and it, it's kind of a mutual, I was, I sang in the choir, and, you know, I liked to, I was active in the church and everything like that, and he was so bashful. He wouldn't even hardly say a word. And <laughs> as you can did tell, he, did, he, did, he, did he have an uh, Arkansas accent? I don't remember if he had much. Oh yeah, I evident, evidently I did because people <laughs> told me I did. <laughs> but I dated her eight months before I kissed her goodnight. <laughs> <laughs> and what about when you first came at seven years old? Did the kids make fun of your accent when you came from Oklahoma? No, I think I was called four eyes a little bit because oh, I was okay. wearing glasses. You know, the kids are so cruel sometimes. But. My wife, she moved to California when she was six from Virginia. Mm -hmm. And she still remembers crying when the kids made fun of her the way she talked. No, yeah, I didn't. Nobody made fun of me. I, I, maybe I didn't have that much of an okey accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you guys met and then you went together for how long before you got married and stuff? 19 April 4th of 1942 we, got, we married. got married. We okay. dated from 1939 to 1942. Okay, let's just kind of continue on with that and then we'll go back to back to 1942. Uh, so you've been married for how many years now? 67, be 68 in April. Wow. And children? Three, and two boys what, and a girl. And what are their names? Uh, the oldest is Jerry and Deanna and Daryl. And where do they live? Well, um, Jerry and Daryl live in Buena Park, and Deanna lives in Palm Desert. Oh. Yeah. That's why we're down here. Yeah, yeah. good. And do you have uh, grandchildren? Yes, we had seven, and they're all married, and we've got uh, 18 great grandkids. 18? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's so much. <laughs> and, um, um, and how long have you lived down here in Palm Desert now? We, um, we bought a house where we live in La Quinta. Mm -hmm. And um, we bought a place in La Quinta the 17th of February. It went through escrow. Oh, just recently? Uh -huh. Oh, well, good. Well, glad to have you here. And your daughter, how long has she been living here in the desert? Oh, let's see. I believe, I believe her. She, she, she's retired from the school district oh, here, I, uh, our no. daughter. Oh, so she's been here for quite a while. Yeah, then. she yeah. worked in the, in the district office where I was working uh, before they moved down here. and. Uh, Let's yeah. see. Well, Dan was born in 1977, and he was a baby, so he might have moved in about 1978, oh, something okay. like that down here. Okay, and he, well, he's a successful uh, contractor, building contractor. Uh, her husband. Uh -huh. Her husband. And you have a church down here, I assume. Coachella. Coachella yeah. Landmark Missionary Baptist Church. <laughs> okay, Landmark Mission Baptist. So Mission. there are more than one. There, I mean, that name or. Oh, there's, there's uh, Missionary Baptist Churches, but they, they might take, like, La Harbor Missionary Baptist Church. This was, oh, okay. this was the landmark. They chose that I, I, name. They just chose that name. Okay. In Coachella. In Coachella. So how, how long does it take you to get down there? Oh, about 25 minutes yeah, well, from our place. Mm -hmm. Not too bad when you lived in L.A. Huh? <laughs> and oh, my goodness. <laughs> when, when we were in, the, in Nevada, it, it was 450 miles away to our closest child in Wayne Park. <laughs> so that's why they were, the kids were all... 
uh, wanting us to move back down here, and, our, and we knew that we were going to have to do, make a move sometime. Because yeah. we weren't getting any younger, yeah. <laughs> no, no family. And uh, the, I, I assume you're fairly active in the church then? Not down here. I was mm -hmm. up until we came here. I'm not able to now. Yeah. <laughs> but I was always pianist wherever I went. Oh, really? Okay. So do you still play? I mean, yes, for fun? I guess, I guess, like uh, not for the church, but for, just, for my own enjoyment, sure. I guess you'd say. And the both of you, what, um, what other activities are you, do you enjoy doing down here? We used to play a lot of tennis, but that's <laughs> in the past now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't, we, it's just been, being with family, mm -hmm. mostly with family. Yeah. Um, right now, we, we're still unpacking. <laughs> take it, I don't know how long it'll take us to get those unpacked boxes open, but it's right. got to come one these days. And how did you uh, find out about the museum, the, pump, the air museum here? Well, the kids took us, I guess. Oh, okay. Our daughter and her son-in-law, yeah. uh, oh, long ago, when they come down for a visit, yeah. they took us to the Air Museum yeah. at mm -hmm. that time. And yeah, well, I'm sure glad to have you. Our six-year-old great-grandson said that he was ba saved and he wanted to be baptized. And he, ta he talked it with his father. His father's a deacon, and he uh, wanted, he talked to his dad and told him that he wanted to be saved. He didn't want to go to hell. And so he, <laughs> his father talked to him and he didn't try to push him. He told him, he says, well now son, he says, do you know what you're saying? Do you know what you really want and what, what? And he said he definitely did and he didn't, he wanted, they asked him if he wanted to go forward and uh, submit himself for baptism. He said, I want to go tonight and be baptized tonight. <laughs> he knew so, what he wanted. <laughs> so he was baptized about a couple of weeks ago. Oh, well, good for him. He was, uh, is he seven or six? No, he was just six in June. Uh -huh. oh, good. He's very alert. Yeah. And, but he was raised that way. And he's, you know, yeah. he was, okay. Um, I'm going to kind of pop back and we'll kind of get into the, your military. So, do you want to stay there for the rest of the time, or would you like to come back over here? Uh, I just must go back over here. That's fine. That's fine. I just want you to be comfortable. So, thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to watch it again. That's what got me in. Just don't want to chair. Okay, Julie, how much time we got over there? It's 32 minutes, I okay. think. And again, my side isn't. <laughs> oh, good. It's 32 you're, Nope, you're right. <laughs> we are right. <laughs> you right down to <laughs> Okay. Um, so you were. <laughs> You were working, what kind of a factory were you working in, you said, uh, like around 1940, 41? And that, you were working somewhere, you were telling me, in L.A. before you went into the service. Yes, I was working for Thermador Electric before I went, at the time I went in the service, I was working for Thermador Electric. Okay. And then after I came out, I worked a short time for them and then went to work for a building outfit called Superior Tank. Okay, well, 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 we'll get that later. Right, let's, let's go back to where we're... we're okay, uh, December 7th came along, and so, first of all, what did you think when you first heard that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor? What did you think about that, with the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor? Did, could you see something like that coming? I suspicioned it because my father, when I was still on the farm, they, they came around collecting scrap metal, buying up scrap metal, and my father said uh, that this stuff was all going to Japan at that time, and my father said we'll get it back in bombs one of these days. Uh, that's what he predicted back in, in the, uh, what would it have been? Uh, 39 or so. Yeah. 39, 38, 37 or somewhere along yeah. there. Huh. Yeah. Maybe even 36. Yeah. Uh, but he predicted that that was, he was a very good Indian predictor. I mean, he could predict the weather by looking at the moon and watching the moon signs. He would, and he could hit it pretty good. He was good about growing uh, gardening and stuff like that because he seemed to be able to read the moon signs and all quite well. 
Did he talk about his Indian heritage at all? No, not he no. didn't. Uh, never did even talk a whole lot about his parents. Uh, I understand that he, uh, his mother died when he was about 18 years old or something like that, and his mm -hmm. father had died before that. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know a whole lot about it, and he didn't talk an awful lot about it. He, mm -hmm. he was kind of like a lot of Indians are, quiet and don't have a, I have I've been accused of not <laughs> talking very much myself. <laughs> because. And I hope, uh, I hope you make up for it. I do, believe me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And um, so, did you get drafted, or, or how did you yeah, get into the? I was I was drafted, but I had told him I wanted to go into the Air Force, and luckily I was able to get it, what I wanted. Okay. And um, so you, but you were married when you went into the service. Yes, sir. Okay. And had you <clears throat> had any children by this time? No. The, I uh, my. Son was born after I was in the service a while. Okay. I was, and in fact, is I went to basic training in Kearns, Utah, which is what we called the end of the world because it was a a camp that they had built a huge big camp, and it was still in the process of being built when they shipped men in by the thousands, and we only had one mess hall open in the in the area where these all these people were being shipped in and we would line up for a quarter of a mile sometimes to going to the mess hall. They were feeding us two meals a day, what we call what they called meals. We if we were lucky enough to get in line and get into the mess hall, we got a, a small box of of dry cereal with a some powdered milk for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And then whenever lunch came, if you was like, if, if they didn't close the door before you got up to the mess hall, they had boiled potatoes, and they they boiled them in big 15-gallon things. They cut a potato in half and give you a half a potato and a piece of horse meat about that square. I mean, and that's that's what you had. And most of the time, we didn't have any bread to go with it. Sometimes we had uh, bread at times, but many of the guys uh, went AWOL. Some of the officers went AWOL because of the bad conditions. Some of the guys died from. They were giving shots. We had they had lost our shot records on the travel, and they started giving us shots over again and. That was pretty rough on them, and some of them actually died because of, I guess, poor food and, yeah. and the shots and so forth. So as a result, a lot of the officers went to Salt Lake City and turned themselves in to get out of the... They didn't even have wooden guns for us to practice with. They just got us out there and made us back, march back and forth uh, for 10, 12 hours a day. Mm. and. Uh, I had a problem when of going into that higher altitude. My nose would all of a sudden start bleeding badly, and mm -hmm. the guys would start passing out <laughs> that was around us. <laughs> now this was uh, the Army Air Corps, so this is probably this basic, is you're basic, basic training, training for the Army, most likely. That was likely. before I went into went the, the Air, Air Force. Air it Corps. was basic training. Yeah, and it was a bad place. I mean, yeah. very. <laughs> but eventually. I was sent over to Salt Lake City for a short period of time, and then from there to Spokane, Washington, Geiger Field Airport, and that's when they assigned me to the refueling units and had me trained to work on the big rigs and operate them for refueling the planes. Had you been around machinery? Well, I'm sure you had being on the. Well, you didn't have a tractor though. But did, had you driven any? You drove a car, but any trucks or anything like that prior to that? I had driven trucks some and driven tractors a little bit, but not that not that much. But yeah. this was a huge, big tractor with double trailers, and yeah. it was different. I mean, <laughs> it was like climbing up into. <laughs> something you weren't used to at least. Yeah. I think it had about 29 gears or something. <laughs> for, uh, it had uh, front wheel drives as well as the... Uh, Did you worry about the danger of 
being around gasoline, things that could explode and all that stuff? You know, I don't think I give it that much thought. I've thought about it since then and wondered because we had ground wires on the planes when they came in uh, that was supposed to hit the ground and ground the plane because static electricity could mm -hmm. spark sometimes and cause, but fortunately I never had no problems that way. I never... So up at Geiger Field, what kind of planes did they have up there? They had B-17s. B-17s yeah. is what I first went into there and I was assigned to the 18th, I mean the 34th Bomb Group and the 18th Bomb Squadron at that time. This might be a good time. Um, Why don't you take this and I, let's go over to this B-17. Let me kind of focus in on it and tell me a little bit about, I mean most of us know pretty much, you know, had like 10, a crewman of 10 and or and uh, oh, 13 certain, guns and stuff like that. But like where, how, where do you, where would you refuel it? The gas fill pot pipes are on top of the wings. There's about oh. three or four different places that and the main tanks were near the towards the fuselage. The what they call the Tokyo tanks, which was a additional tanks that were in the smaller part of the wing was out further mm -hmm. on there. And it um, if I understand it correctly, the G model uh, capacity was about with the filling the Tokyo tanks was about 3,500 gallons. Hmm. How long would it take you to fill one? It would probably take uh, an hour or two hours to fill the, because the tanks, the Tokyo tanks were, went from uh, different sections in the wing that, that the gas had to flow from one tank hmm. to another to mm -hmm. fill them up. Yeah. Huh. Um, and I mean, you see, we see pictures of like planes explode. I assume either that hits the bombs or it hits their gas tanks uh, in the wings when they get a, a flak burst, a direct flak flak burst. I'm I'm sorry. I'm I, I say I see. We see photographs of B-17s that explode in the sky, and I'm from flak, and I assume that the flak either hits the the bombs or they maybe they hit the wing and uh, sets the plane the on fire. That, the one that exploded, the one that I, that was December the 24th, about six o'clock in the morning, and it was during the Battle of the Bulls, and the planes were taking off because we had, it had been a time of snow and so forth that we hadn't been able to get the planes in the air. Finally, we put sand on the runways and got where we could felt safe to, for the planes to take off, but this one, when it got near the end of the runway, it veered off to the left, which was a high bank there, and I happened to be right in that area that was close to where I had parked my trucks, and I ran to the office and called for ambulance. The plane, front, the wheels of the plane struck the bank, and the fuselage broke partially in half, and then went into the woods and uh, began to burn and it was loaded with 200 pound bombs and a full load of, of high octane fuel. Uh, after the ambulance got there, I had helped carry one man to the ambulance and then was running with a stretcher towards the plane again when I got about uh, 300 feet of the plane, the plane blew up and it knocked me out. I fell to the ground and I thought I'd been there for a spell of time, but it had to have only been a few seconds because I looked up and the sky was full of shrapnel and flames and a supercharger, which is on the bottom of each engine that weighs about 300 pounds, one of those was coming right down at me where I was laying and I crawled a few feet and it hit right where I was at. Mm. I got up and went on to the to the plane after I kind of got come to myself and they had pulled out uh, some of the men by the plane but the explosion went up and over and it didn't affect them. It didn't hurt them because they were too close for the explosion to 
the, but one man, the bombardier, was leg was caught in the plane, and he was screaming, saying, cut my leg off or do anything, get me out of here. And one of our men stayed with him almost too long. He just jumped from the plane and, and it exploded right after he left the plane. But the one man was left in mm. because he was trapped. And it blew a hole in the ground, probably 150 feet in diameter and about 15 foot deep. And it, uh, one of the men in another squadron that was about a mile away from where we were saw a spark plug come down. He saw something smoking and he went over and looked and it was one of the smart spark plugs from that plane that had fell, which was about a mile away. It it, uh, it did a lot of a lot of damage around. It stripped the trees to to where they looked like toothpicks almost. And a dumb thing that the ordnance officer and I, within a few hours after that, walked down in that hole and there was three bombs that hadn't exploded and they were so hot you couldn't touch your hand on them. And we walked in there and not thinking of how dangerous it was. But they afterwards they hooked wires to them and exploded those bombs that were left. And and how many guys were uh, killed on that? How many of the crew were killed? Uh, you know I can't say for sure because uh, they do, you didn't know a lot about what happened when somebody went to the hospital. You didn't hear anything more. The rest of us didn't hear anything more from them. So I can't say for sure how many uh, was rescued. I believe the first one that I helped uh, take to the ambulance died because he was cut up pretty bad. Mm -hmm. There was one of them that came walking and when I walked out towards the plane after it first crashed, he had been thrown out of the plane and came walking up and I asked him where he came from and he said he was thrown out of that plane. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, <clears throat> So there probably were some survivors anyway. Uh, hmm. That's about all I can think or remember about the that, yeah. a bomb, about the plane exploding. Right. And now that was, um, which air base were you on when that happened? Which air base? December the 24th, uh, the day before Christmas in 1944, and it was uh, about 6 o'clock in the morning. In England? Yes, sir. And, and let, let's kind of go back just a little bit then. Um, when did you go overseas? Uh, well, we had been a training outfit in Rapid City, South Dakota for a spell there, and we left uh, Rapid City the 4th of uh, April, 1944, when we left, and we went to Massachusetts and boarded a ship there, the ground crews and so forth. They, the planes only uh, took skeleton crews with them when they flew across. The ble there are planes that we had for the for the group was flying across. They they had to go up by Iceland and that way and go across. But they just took a skeleton crew, and the rest of us went on a ship. Uh, uh, where where did the ship uh, leave from? Where did the ship leave from? Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. And what kind of a ship was that? It, it had been a, uh, a passenger ship, but it had been converted into a troop transport ship. And I, I can't say the name of it right this minute. I, I, <laughs> but anyway, it was a, a rough ride and we, we didn't have any, uh, uh, what do you call it? The support. We they zigzag, oh. but at one time when we were out in the uh, off from Iceland, there they they claimed that there was four or five German U-boats that was trying to pick us up, and they they sent out planes, and if, apparently we got away from them because we never. No, were you were you by yourself your ship or were you in a yes, convoy? So we you, had you, no escorts no with escorts, the ship. Just by and that's the reason they zigzagged right. and traveled it. By the way, it, I meant to say any of you three that want to ask anything, feel free to do so as we're going along here. Okay. The ship was about anything. 700 feet long, I believe, and 
we got into a storm out in the middle of the ocean and it was something that you wouldn't believe. Uh, one of the men that was sleeping, our particular group of men was in a room back kind of over the stern, uh, down in the stern area and when the big screws would, when the ship would go up and down, the big screws would hit the top of the water and they'd go whoa, 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 whoa. and this guy that was next to me, he'd jump out of the bed and he'd say, oh God, Sanders, it's a torpedo. And he said, I told him, just stay in bed. If a torpedo hit us, we wouldn't know the difference anyway. So uh, to forget about it, but he blistered his hands gripping the, the sack rail, you know, in the <laughs> ships. Uh, well, hanging on during the night that night, it was a terrible storm. And where did you dock over there? Liverpool, England. We we went into the uh, channel, I guess you call it, between Ireland and England. It's Liverpool, England. That's a bad spot in there. That Irish Sea. It they had. It, water would come up in pyramids up under the ship and it would slide off like to like just you wouldn't believe I almost fell off because I was standing in the back of the ship by a post that come down from an upper deck and I grabbed to hold the post and my feet actually left the deck the ship turned up with such a pitch to it that my feet left the deck I had to ha hang on to the pole unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and so was your the base that you went to, uh, what was the name of that again? Your base in England, uh, the B-17 the, base. They called it Nutamstead, the little village. It was uh, the railroad station close to us was called Royston. Mm -hmm. It was about 12 miles uh, south of uh, Cam uh, Cambridge, England, the Cambridge College of England. It was about 12 miles south of that, but the the base itself was called Nut Amstead, N-U-T-H-A-M-S-T-E-A-D, Nut Amstead. <laughs> and it, it was uh, uh, Station 131 was it called, the station number of the... And you had B-17s there exclusively? That was B-17 base. That's all they had was B-17s? Well, occasionally we would have a fighter or something that might land that was running low on fuel or something like that. And then the, the officers did have an A-22 two-engine mm -hmm. plane that was developed later that they liked to fly and mess around with. Uh, and what bomb group was that? Your bomb group? What bomb group was that? 398th bomb group. And there's, there was four squadrons, 600, 601, 602, and 603. And I was in the 603rd squadron. And that's the 8th Air Force. 8th Air Force. You're the 8th Air Force? Yes, sir. It was, uh, we were in the 1st Division of the 8th Air Force. Right. And the... Uh, did they have triangles on their tails? Our, our planes had a triangle on the tail right. section on them. Yeah. And um, do, so you got there, uh, were they flying missions right off the bat when you first got there? Were they in the midst of flying missions? It, or uh, it took a few days before they got organized and uh, was, uh, but there were a lot of other groups as well in, the, in England at the time. I'm not too familiar with the... But when you got there, they were just setting the base up and with the squadrons and things? They had changed it from a fighter base to a bomber base and they had to do some work on it. And they were still doing some work on the air on the airstrips whenever we got there. They We had to wait a little while, but, but shortly after that, they started going on missions. And when did you first get there? When did you first get there? What date did you first get there? I believe the 21st of uh, April was, I believe that's what it was, the uh, 21st of April, 44. 1944. Um, those pictures um, of his were, oh, they must be, no, no. Oh yeah, uh, Julie, that's right. Okay. Um, 
the how many and how long did you spend there? Were you there? How long <coughs> before? How how many months did you spend at that base? Well, we, uh, as I say, we got there in April and we stayed until I believe it was June something of 1945. Whenever we went to uh, uh, Scotland and boarded the Queen Mary and came back to uh, yeah. New York Harbor, we came right in by the. Uh, Statue of Liberty and so forth, and yeah. it was kind of foggy. We couldn't see it too good, but we were able to see this. What was your feeling? What was your feeling at that time? Well, it was, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, anxiety about the time it was taking to unload and to get off the ship, and then we were sent over to New Jersey to a base for about couple of weeks or something before they put us on a train to come to Camp Beale, California. I was discharged at uh, San Pedro, that Fort MacArthur is the place where I was in, inducted into service and that's where I got my discharge. I know in the movies you see and the uh, there's one documentary you've probably seen that William Wyler had uh, filmed uh, about the uh, Memphis Bell and all the missions that it went on and, and they were coming back. And you always see the ground crew really nervous looking to see how many planes came back. Is that what it was like? That, that is one of the things that I was showing you about the ambulance that was waiting and, and of course the guys that worked on the planes and so forth that was always waiting to see and make sure that their plane came back. I mean, yeah. but sometimes there was a disappointment. If I'm not mistaken, on one mission, our squad, our four squadrons, I don't know for sure how many planes they sent out, but I think there was 27 shot down one day. That and and I know another day, our squadron sent. Ten planes out, and seven of them were shot down. I think there's usually they usually try and send out. I think 13 in a squad or 12, 13 like that. So probably over 50 some odd planes. So there'd been half, half of them were shot down that one time where you lost 27. It sounded like. Yeah. And I just want to show this picture. I'm going to show them this picture here and tell me a little bit about that. About this this picture here. Oh, yeah. I oh, that's that. that's one of the planes that uh, was shot up like this uh, over the target, and it, the pilot actually flew it back to England and landed it. And I took this picture right after it landed. I was there and took the picture myself. You had your own camera there. You had your own camera. I I had a little camera, a little small one that I wasn't mm -hmm. supposed to have, and. I, but I took pictures anyway, and I got by with it. Uh, and this particular one, it looks like it shot about half the tail off, and and uh, where the tail gunner would, would it, have been. Uh, the the fact that it shot almost uh, almost all of the vertical fin off, and shot the the uh, rudder and the elevators. You can see some of the elevators hanging in the uh, there. And how he was able to fly it is more than I can understand. And uh, mm -hmm. most people would probably say he couldn't possibly have done it, but I know it happened because I saw it. And did you have some pretty close friends in your uh, in your outfit? The, oh you, yeah, there uh, was. Uh, do, you there was uh, do you remember any any of the in, guys? In our, you the have? ground crews, uh, I wasn't uh, too familiar with the flying crews because they they stayed in a separate area of where the ground crews did. They were actually in a separate area. The officers had their sections and then the flying crews had their sections of even their sleeping quarters and so forth was separate from where our ground crews were. Now you were in charge of uh, several guys? How, how I, had, that I had about Ten or twelve guys that were working for me with the, we had the uh, two tractor with double trailers that we hauled eight thousand gallon of gas at a trip, and then we had a, a oil truck also that we had to have a driver driving that and and putting oil in the planes when it was needed. 
And you guys took care of all the planes in your squadron? Yes, sir. And which would be about how many planes would that be? Well, they tried to maintain uh, somewhere between 18 to 30 planes per squadron is what mm -hmm. they tried to maintain. Sometimes they lost a lot of them and were not able to get replacements for a while, but we tried to maintain a, a 20 to 30 planes is what we were tempted to maintain for each squadron. And in a typical day, how many planes would you be required to uh, gas up, let's say? Well, about the only thing I can say is one time whenever we, uh, during the Battle of the Bulls, I believe that was, uh, one other guy and I, or one night it was actually, him and I pumped over 45,000 gallon of gas in the planes that mm -hmm. night, so you can imagine. Uh, and did you have more than one truck that you get, that you... Uh... We, we, there were two of us and we had two rigs with double trailers. Each trailer and each rig uh, hauled 8,000 gallon of gas at a load. Okay. When we filled up, well, we, went, we went to a dump to fill up the what they called a fuel dump and filled the trucks from the top and then brought them back to the area where we parked the planes. So how many planes at a time could be refueled? I mean... Well, we refueled them uh, pretty much as they returned from missions. There would be well, sometimes I, they would come in at different times. I mean, there might be some of the planes come in earlier than others, but as they landed one by one or whatever, well, then we would go right to work and start refilling them. I mean, if there were two or three planes sitting around, did you have enough trucks and stuff to be doing each one of them at the same time, or did you have to do one plane and when it got finished, you started another plane? Well, actually, we just filled until we run low on gas and then we would go and refill the trucks oh, okay. and, and that that was we just filled the planes as we okay so you, while one truck is going to getting fuel another one it, uh, oh it could be yes to, that's that right thing, we so. were we had individual drivers driving each truck and so right. uh, one truck might be going to fill up the truck while the other one was still filling planes and so forth, yeah. so we yeah. worked. On one occasion, uh, I don't know if I told you that uh, it was, uh, I'm not sure if it was during the Battle of the Bulge, it wasn't far from that, if, it, if not. One night I was, uh, we were refueling and uh, a German ME-109 fighter plane came over and we had made the mistake of leaving some lights on in the nose of the B-17 and he made a circle and came back and come in and strafed us and he put seven bullets in the plane next to the one that I was servicing and he I put, I got three 30 caliber bullets out of my front tires on the truck that I was driving, the tractor mm -hmm. that, it was loaded with 8,000 gallon of high octane fuel. So, and his 20 millimeter shells quit hitting about uh, 30 feet in front of my truck. So, if he had, if he had stayed focused on shooting on the, he would have blowed my truck to pieces because it was coming right towards me. And his 20 millimeters. I could follow them by big holes in the ground because when they hit, they explode. And so I, I've still got some of the shrapnel and the two of the bullets that I took out of the tires. And I got some of the shrapnels that I got out of the hole of the 20 millimeters and two of the bullets I still have with that I got out of the tires. <laughs> um, the, um how many, we, we, I showed that, we looked at that one where, uh, how many planes do you remember coming back that were shot up pretty badly like like this? Well, I know our, you showed me one that had a our, nose. I would, nose. I would probably only see mainly the our own uh, 
our own squadron right. because we were located probably a half mile or mile apart the squadrons were even though they were based on the same base stationed on the same base they were mile apart so we didn't actually have too much uh, uh, to do with the other squadrons it would only be our squadron and it uh, sometimes there would be planes come in that I wouldn't be on duty or I wouldn't know about so that it was it was occasionally that you would see them but they usually if they had injured men or dead men on the planes when they came back they would make a circle over the base and fire uh, flares and flag, let us yeah. know that that way they would have an ambulance ready to pick them. What was the weather like over there? It was pretty nice most of the time. We had a lot of fog and uh, and we did have some cold snowy weather at that time uh, along just about, about the time the Germans were uh, giving them such a bad time in the Battle of the Bulls. We had snow, pretty deep snow then. It made, held us up for a while, for a week or so. We couldn't put any planes in the air. Were there any mid-air collisions? Were any mid-air collisions in your area? Oh yeah, I'm sure there was, and there was uh, a number of collisions. Uh, you you may have you may have seen it in some of the other writings. One of our planes uh, crashed off the end of the runway. It actually took out a farmer's chicken houses uh, wings to. But it didn't damage, he landed in a field and it didn't damage it bad enough, but what? Some of our men went over and done a lot of repair work and took the guns and everything, all the weight and the, any, anything that was removable, took it off of the plane. And then we, they rigged up some, uh, what do you call the um, rocket brackets? Uh -huh. The only B-17 that had ever done that, they f fixed uh, brackets under the wings on each w side and put three rockets under there. And then a pilot, uh, they laid down metal runway on that and there was a big tree out in front of where they were taken off from and they had to clear that tree so they used those rockets and, and you'll read about it in other places, you'll see it in I've, I have seen it where they, they when they took it off that that was the only B-17 that they ever uh, flew out of a place like that wow. and used rockets to lift it oh, off and, and they made it fine. Okay, I gotta change tapes here. Yeah. How you doing? You want a sip of water? You doing okay? Well, I've got mine with me, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Are you doing all right, Joey? I am exactly that I've got it all this afternoon. Oh, okay, Joey. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Julie. The Korean guy, well, I might have him in on Friday, so if you'd like to come in. Yeah, about the same time. Thank you. Nice to meet you, too. What time did you have? Thank you, Sergeant Saunders. The time? I have about 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you kindly. <laughs> I've looked maybe a little more than that. Okay. I think it's really bunched up, about 15 minutes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. Good. And um, when you went on leave, I think you said you went to Edinburgh? Edinburgh and Glasgow. And Glasgow. Yeah. How was that? What was that like? It was very interesting. We went into a, a courtroom where they, they still used the old... Uh, I guess you'd say like George Washington <laughs> wigs, uh, toupees that they put on the yeah. people that were in the courtroom was had these. What do you call them? Uh, uh, the wig of some wig, sort. I some know. kind of a wig yeah. on on, and it was interesting to listen to them. <laughs> that yeah. was there at uh, yeah. Edinburgh. Yeah. Did you get to London at all? London at all? Oh yeah, I went to London a number of times. I went uh, went to the wax museum. They had a, a wax form of Joe Lewis that was actually 
made like it was breathing. It showed that he was breathing and so forth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the yeah. in the wax museum, it was. Yeah. yeah, I got to go and I got to see him change the guard at the Buckingham Palace. At the Buckingham Palace, and I uh, went into uh, Saint Paul's Cathedral. It it was uh, unbelievable at the time I went there because all the buildings for for blocks around that building had been flattened almost and I went up uh, if you're ever in London you want to go to that place and see it because you go up about 300 feet in uh, stairs up into a big dome and the dome is about 300 feet in diameter and they call it the whispering dome and they had a uh, part of the group to go one way on the balcony thing that was inside the dome to go around to the opposite side and then the leader of the group put his head to the wall and whispered and he told us to put our ear to the wall on the other side and we could hear him just like he was right yeah. next to us and it was <laughs> over 300 feet across. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I could see so much damage all around. In fact, I've got a lot of little pictures that shows leveled buildings mm -hmm. around. There was only one bomb that had hit it when I was there, and it <clears throat> it didn't explode. It went through the roof and went into the floor, and they had banisters around it, <coughs> excuse me, to protect people from getting too close to it, but it was a bomb that had hit that building. <clears throat> um. Did you, um, were there any buzz bombs coming in, any Germans, any of those rockets, German V bombs and stuff coming when you were over there? I, I, one night I went, uh, went <clears throat> on leave to a little town not too far from where we were called Hitchin. And uh, I was sitting in the park there in the evening and I counted 18 of those uh, V2 bombs that they had going over and hitting in London. Mm -hmm. But they were, <clears throat> they were so, they went so high and arced over and then you would see the explosion flash before you'd hear the sound of the mm -hmm. bomb going over. Mm -hmm. But the old, what we call the putt-putt bombs, they, I've heard a lot of those, they'd come putting a little single cylinder engine and the, then it would start cutting out. We had one to fall close to our base and one that fell while I was on leave one weekend and knocked the windows out of our uh, Quonset hut where we slept. Mm. Yeah. We had the, one of the big bombs to hit in our bomb uh, yard where we stored the bombs and did a lot of damage to some buildings and not <clears throat> knocked the bombs that were stacked up down. but didn't set any of them off. Yeah. Mm. So we were fortunate there. Yeah, we were. The B-17s that came back, I mean most of them were probably had holes in them at least and shot up so the ground crew guys they had to repair all that to get them ready for the next day. That must have been quite a quite a job. Yeah it was, uh, it, uh, if they were damaged too much they sent them to a, another area but uh, minor damage we had men that did that kind of work, that did patchwork on the wings. And right. In fact, I had a picture, and I don't know if I had it in this, with a couple of them that's showing a, a wing tip that had, I forget how many holes in the wing tip, that they just removed the wing tip and replaced the wing tip. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> so do you remember uh, your crew, uh, the guys that worked for you, did everybody get along pretty well? Did everyone get along pretty well? Uh, yes, as far as I know, the, there was only one time that I had any problems. Uh, there was a big boy by the name of... I can't say his that's, name no, right that, now. No, that's right. Anyway, he was an Italian boy and um, uh, he was kind of a lazy person and he would sleep in, his crew chief would let him sleep in and wouldn't bother him about it and he was kind of lazy. He accused me of stealing his 
writing board that he used to write letters on and uh, he kept telling me I had to go in and wake one of my men up that slept in a bunk above him and he got mad at me because I was waking him up and he kept threatening me and telling me he was going to get up and beat me up and so one day I went in and he started accusing me of stealing his board and I said you've been threatening me for a long time, why don't you do something about it? And he stood up and he said, so-and-so Sanders said, this is time I've been looking for. And so he, I, he said, hit me. And I said, go ahead, you're the one that wanted to start it. He raised his arm and started to hit me and I hit him under the eye and cut his eye open and he fell to the floor and I grabbed him up and put him stood him up and hit him again and knocked him across the bunk and uh, the third time I hit him he grabbed me after I hit him he grabbed me around the arms and tried to hold me hold my arms down I got one arm out from under his arm and got around his neck and gave him a flip and threw him on the floor and busted my elbow but I started to work him over and the guys come and grab me and pull me off of him and said yeah, he, he's had enough and said if the MPs come in you're both in trouble so uh, he never gave me no more trouble and our some of our other men said that he had been a different guy after that happened and I said well maybe something turned good out yeah. of it but I said I I didn't I took all I was going to I wasn't going to put up with it anymore if, if he was wanting to take it out so but everybody was surprised and I was too because I'll be honest he was bigger than I was but I had grew up with a bunch of rough brothers and I knew a little bit about fighting and so I I, I knew I had to use it in a hurry yeah. um, do, do you keep have you did you ever keep in contact with any of the any of the guys that you worked with over there after the war, did you have any any good friends that you kept contact with? You know, I talked to one boy, one of the boys that that drove a truck for me. Uh, um, what was his name? Um, he was from uh, uh, um, Nevada, above where I lived there. And uh -huh. uh, after I, I heard. The, in in the flak news that I get from the 398 bomb group, I got his address or phone number or something and called him and talked to him a time or two and he said he would, uh, George Tilbury was his name and he was a good truck driver. He knew what he was doing. He had driven trucks before he went in the service so I depended on him a lot because he was a good truck driver but, but he died about a year or two ago. I called his place again a few days ago and before we came down here yeah. and his wife told me that he had passed away last October I mean a year ago and did you write a lot of letters back to Helen and back and forth did you guys write to each other when she was here she wrote about every day of course I wasn't there was a lot of times that I wasn't allowed to write yeah. a lot of the yeah uh, areas where we were and and they censored your letters everything that you wrote they censored everything that so you didn't write any more than you and I never was much of a writer to be honest but she wrote I think about every day but sometimes I would get six or eight letters or ten and then maybe I'd go for a month before I'd get another letter because of the deliveries that wasn't uh, and where was she living at the time she was living in Fullerton, California, with her mother and dad. And but you had had you been renting a house before you went into the before you left, or you? Got yes, we had been married, and uh, we rented a little apartment there in Fullerton, and then we rented uh, later we rented a house that was out on uh, West Fullerton, and uh, her brother lived next to the house that we rented. And then shortly after that, I had to go in the service. So. Helen, were you? Did you have a job or anything when he was over there overseas? No, I, no, I didn't at the time. I, I had quit, uh, quit the bank to have the 
have my little boy, and then I was taking care of him. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so when you came back uh, from the service, uh, did, did you, uh, what did you do when you got out of the uh, Air Force, Air Corps? I went back to work right away to Thermidor Electric in mm -hmm. Maywood, worked that we, they put me in a department where we were making uh, uh, fluorescent transformers and so forth at that time. And I stayed there for a while and then, then uh, um, I went to work for Superior Tank and Construction Company, working in the oil fields, building big oil field tanks and pipeline work and all that kind of stuff. Was that in Southern California? Around yeah, Southern in California? Santa Fe Springs and and San Pedro down in that area did a lot of pipe work and stuff in there. And then all over the area around La Habra, the Standard Oil, I don't know if you're familiar, there used to be a big Standard Oil plant there in between Buena Park and La Habra. There were a lot of oil wells back uh, years mm -hmm. ago with even the wooden derricks and so forth. So there was a lot of oil wells around. Santa Fe Springs was the, the most productive productive area of oil wells in California at that time as far as I know. Yeah. But it, in a sense, I've gotten to where I don't know if it's still operating or not. But I worked in the oil field mm -hmm. building, we call, they called them bolted tanks, and worked in the shop sometimes cutting and making decks and bottoms and so forth for the big tanks as well. Were you still living in Fullerton all that time? Uh, well, yes we were. Um, we moved to Buena Park in uh, 1951. 1951 we moved to Buena Park. And then, and we lived in the one house there for about 17 or 18 years, and then we moved to the east part of Buena Park, and bought a home, a little bigger home. What street? We, what street was that on? Pardon what me. What street? What was the address? On what uh, street? Six four six two Rostrada was the first house we bought. It was a, a two bedroom house and a, and a double garage, a fairly new house. We bought it for $8,300. We kept it for about 18 or 19 years. We bought a place over in East, East La Buena Park, near the airport, a three-bedroom house. We bought it for $30,000. We sold the one on Rostrata for $30,000. And we kept the one on, Ross, on uh, Beethoven, uh, The number um, 8410. 8410? 8410 Beethoven. Is a, it was a three bedroom house, about 1400 square feet. We uh, kept it um, till 1992. We had been offered 225000 for it, and we sold it to our youngest son, who was looking for a place at the time. For 169,000, we went to uh, Gardnerville, Nevada, and bought a home, a, a three-bedroom, is a three-car garage, a third of an acre lot, and about 1760 square foot house. We paid 142,000 for that, paid cash for that, and we stayed there for. Uh, 17 years, I guess it was, and then we sold the house for 325000 and came and bought a house in La Quinta, paid 260000 for that one. And so <laughs> You've done well. <laughs> yeah, new house payments. <laughs> no, that, that's really nice. Um, um, so after the oil fields, now you told me that was it who was it that you went in with on that Union Oil Station, that 70, Union 76 station? Yes, sir. My brother and I were operated the 76 station on the corner of Whittier Boulevard and Euclid Street. It is now. It was called Height Street back then. Mm -hmm. But we operated the 76 station there for about uh, 
I think 36 years. I'm not positive 36 or 37 years that we were there. And did then, you work on cars too? Yes, we did all kinds of, it, almost anything except overhauling engines. We did mm -hmm. brake work and mm -hmm. I was uh, worked as a tune-up and air conditioning and and uh, changing water pumps and generators, alternators and so forth. We did almost all kinds of uh, mechanical work. So I actually was a, what you'd call an auto mechanic, I guess. It, and what uh, when you first opened your station, what was uh, what were you selling gas for? Uh, if we weren't having a gas war, we sold uh, seventy six uh, premium gas for eighteen cents a gallon. And uh, I, sometimes when they'd have a gas war, it would go down to twelve to fourteen cents a gallon. I used to when I was dating her, I used to buy five gallons of gas for 96 cents. <laughs> uh, it was uh, yeah. about 18 cents a gallon. Yeah, so, cents, yeah. <laughs> And then in uh, 1973, we came up with that gas shortage. I don't know if yeah, you I remember, remember that. about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. We, had to, we could only open the station to pump gas for about two hours of the morning, and was, a lot of the time we had lines for a, a half a mile from the station waiting to get gas and we had a little problem sometimes because some people would want you to put more gas but we had been told if we put more than 10 gallon in a car that we could be fined ten thousand dollars so we we told tried to explain that to them that that we could not put more gas than what i hope you didn't have to get in any more fights <laughs> no but come close to it we had come close to it a few times because some people was uh desperate i guess you'd say to get more gas it was pretty rough there for a, quite a spell now you said you guys used to play tennis a lot used to play tennis a lot? She and I used to play tennis, yes. We played tennis. She, she, she had took tennis in school, but I just learned to play, and she beat me to begin with, but I finally got to where I could beat her. <laughs> and where, got, where did you play? Uh, in Fullerton, mainly, yeah. in Buena Park, uh, okay. at the park there in Buena Park. We, they had tennis courts, and we played tennis. Uh, and I used to go to Salt and Sea after I got out of the service. Uh, a group of us guys that worked at Superior Tank used to go to Salt and Sea duck hunting. That was back in 45 to uh, 45 to 48 along there. It was a wide open area, and you could hunt all over down in there around West Marlin. And we took hip boots and waded out <laughs> into the water and. Two other guys and I went one weekend when the season opened. We went down and stayed uh, uh, a day and a half or so. And whenever we counted what we'd shot, we had 56 ducks and three geese. <laughs> wow. Did you ever come to Palm Springs in those days? Not very often, but I did. we did come through there. And we used to go to Indio to the... Um, date festival occasionally mm -hmm. we've gone to that but it was a very small then they was there was none of these uh golf courses and whatever mm -hmm. all over the place at, back then now in, in uh, nevada where where'd you say you lived over there in nevada gardnerville and where is that that's a little town it's about 12 miles south of reno mm -hmm. and it's just we could look out our kitchen window and see the grapevine, I mean the Kingsbury grade road that goes right up over to Lake Tahoe. So we used to go up and spend time at Lake Tahoe. It, we, we, it's a strange thing, we had a lot of people to come and visit us while we were there and we've got pictures of, we took them on the, the, uh, the Zephyr Cove, the paddle boat, they called it the paddle boat, because, but it held about 600 people. You could, uh, to go across, and we we would buy tickets and take them across to the little cove on the other side, the yeah. Emerald Bay Cove. Right. We'd take them across and then bring them back, and we they'd take pictures. So we have a lot of pictures that we had 
say, say the different ones that came to visit us and we'd take them to, on the boat over there. I told my niece, she came out from Northwest Arkansas at one time to see us and my sister and I told her that we were going to take them up and take them across the lake. I said, it's about 14 and a half miles across the lake. And I said, we're going to take you across on the paddle boat and, and uh, take a ride. She says, I don't know if I could do that or not. She was thinking of one that you paddled with your feet. And, and <laughs> she <laughs> I said, oh, no. I said, it's a big boat. It's got a big paddle and like the Mississippi River boat does have on the back of it. And you, it paddles across the lake. And <laughs> I said, it holds about 600 passengers. <laughs> So you still that lake is about 22 and a half mile or 22 and a, 22 miles long, I believe they claim, about 14 and a half miles wide, and in the deeper areas they say it's over 1,700 feet deep. Wow. And uh, you survived. It's a beautiful lake. No, oh, I know. I've been there. You've survived the winters, okay? Up, you survived the winter winters, all right, up there. The weather conditions. We sometimes had two or three foot of snow in the yard and. Uh, believe it or not, I was crazy enough that, and everybody called me that, I went out and shoveled snow for five hours at a time, shoveling, we had a three car garage and I'd shovel the snow off the driveway and then, then off the sidewalk up to the mailboxes which were about three cars up and I shoveled a neighbor's uh, driveways off some of the time and <laughs> they thanked me for that. but. I, <laughs> I enjoyed shoveling the snow. I still would. I'm, I'm, I'm still able. I last time when we were up there, the last winter they, we were there, I should, I'd go out. I had boots that had half-inch thick lining inside the boots. I could go out and stay for five hours when it was five below zero, and it didn't bother me. I just <laughs> keep shoveling. My wife was. She thought I was crazy, and maybe I was, I don't know. <laughs> but people would tell me, they'd say, you old codger, you're going to have a heart attack some these days, <laughs> shoveling that snow, and I said, no. But I, I've, the Lord has been so good to me, I've been able to do, and I'm still strong enough that i get able to do a, a lot of work, a lot of hard work. Everybody. Uh, my gardener that comes and mows my lawns, he says, I can't believe how strong you are. And I said, well, I've, I got to stay that way. I got to keep at it to stay that way. <laughs> I think we're maybe getting ready to wrap it up. Um, Helen, do you have any, anything you want to add to this? Oh, I, don't, I don't think so. I've been enjoying it, reliving the past. <laughs> <laughs> right. it's, a, it's a wonderful past. Julie? Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like to share or say? Or I've add? enjoyed listening to your story too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. I usually, uh, about this time, will ask someone like you who had to join the service, went into harm's way, if you had any advice to young people today, if you have any advice to young people today, maybe going into the service and maybe going over to an area where uh, they're going to be in harm's way like you were, what might it be? Well, it it always pays to keep your mouth shut and keep your eyes open and watch <laughs> what's going about you because you don't you don't talk about things because people find out too much about you if you do and, and that's dangerous. And uh, keep an eye of what's around you at all times and and watch. Be careful where you go that you don't go away from where there are people that you could be put in a position to be picked off like sometimes it happened. Yeah. Well, Dave, uh, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thanks for coming I, in. I got to tell you this. one more little Please. thing that happened to me when I was three years old. Okay. We lived in Henrietta, Oklahoma when I was three years old, uh, from the time I was uh, one year old till I was five years old. When I was about three years old, my brothers used to go down to the railroad and uh, hop on the trains and ride them back and forth because they shifted back and forth picking up coal. It was a coal town 
and the trains would come in and make up a big long string of cars and so I was too little, I was only three years old and I was too little to reach the rails on the cars but they could get a hold of them and stay closer to the engine and ride the cars back and forth. So they got an idea, they put me on the steps of the caboose and uh, I'd get a little bit of a ride once in a while but finally the train made up a big long string of cars and started pulling out. Well when they seen it pulling out they hopped off but by the time I got up to where they were going were the train was going so fast they couldn't even catch it so I began to scream and fortunately there was a conductor in the caboose that came back and seen me and he grabbed the bell and started bringing the engineer and slowed it down and he took me by the hands and set me off in between the rails and he called me a so-and-so little son of a so-and-so <laughs> and said, if I ever catch you on there again, I'll bash your brains out against one of them rails. And he dropped me off and it kind of skinned me up, but I'll tell you, I was glad to get off. <laughs> uh, do you remember any of it? At all? Do you have any memory of that? Do you I, re remember I, it at all? I remember every word that he said. I remember I, I, I haven't forgot it. I, told, I was told by my brothers if I told my mother I would never go back with them anymore so I was my Joe my older brother he always I would when they would take off to go places he would come back I'd scream and cry till he'd come back and get me and he'd put me on his back he wore overalls and I'd put my feet in his hind pockets and hold on to his calluses <laughs> and that's how he come and handled me. So, but I told my mother when I was 14 years old about this train thing happening, and she said, you just dreamed that. So that's just a wild dream you had. I said, call Joe in here and find out if it's true or not. And she called Joe in, and he said, it's absolutely true, but he was told not to tell nobody or else he would <laughs> So <laughs> I got That's a great got by with that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, but well, thanks again, guys. Thank you very much and I do wanna pay you for Okay. For some of the Yeah. Extra uh DVDs if you yeah, and I will, uh, I'll just, uh, this week, I'll make them up and I'll just put, I'll just mail them to you. Have your address there. Oh my gosh. Is your purse like that? My purse is, he oh, heavy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With nothing in it, I don't know why. Hey, Ralph. I, I, I These will not have, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> no. So very nice suit. Thank you. I'm not sure that I'm going to need that. I don't know. That's probably it. Warm nature. That's probably it. You don't give one one of these. I should have wrote the name. I can stay out in the snow. I can think of another freeze. Oh, I bet. I would be too. And our gas bill was $190 something dollars. Oh. <laughs>